Let's go to Nehemiah chapter 8. Nehemiah chapter 8. Nehemiah 8, I'm going to read verses 1 through 3, I'm going to skip to 6, then I'm going to read verse 9 through 11. So once you have Nehemiah chapter 8, say I have it. Here we go. It begins as follows, now all the people gathered together as one man. In the open square that was in front of the water gate. Somebody say the water gate. Mm. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly of men and women who could hear with understanding on the first day of the seventh month. On the first day of the seventh month. Now, according to 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 2, you don't have to go there, but you can go back there afterwards. That month is called Ethanim. Hmm. Verse 3. Verse 3 says, then he read from it, in the open square that it was in front of the water gate from morning until midday. I'm not going to read for y'all that long. Calm down. But he read from the morning until midday before the men and women and those who could understand and the ears of all the people. Somebody say all the people. Let me go back real quick. It says before the men and the women and those who could understand and the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. Verse 4 says that Ezra stood on a platform made of wood, which they made for the purpose. And so we go to verse 6. And verse 6 says, Ezra blessed the Lord. He blessed the Lord, the great God. Someone say, we bless you, Lord. Then all the people answered, Amen, Amen, while lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Let's go to verse 9 through 11. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, remember I told y'all about that handoff that was coming? Here it is. I didn't just say it because it sounded cool in my head. But here you go. <laughs> And Nehemiah, who was the governor, Ezra the priest, and scribe, and the Levites, who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. I hope you're hearing these instructions. I said, Do not mourn or weep, for all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Anybody ever hear, hear the word sometime make you want to cry? We'll get to that. <laughs> Verse number 11. Verse number 11 says this. So, I'm sorry. Let me go back real quick. Verse 10, one more time. Verse 10. Did I skip verse 10? I did. All right. Then he said to them, go your way. Let me get ahead of myself. Then he said to them, go your way. Eat the fat drink the sweet, and send portions for those whom nothing is prepared. For this is holy. This day is holy to our Lord. This day is holy to our Lord. This, okay, do not sorrow. Interesting. Interesting. Well, we find this passage of Scripture because we say this so often time, but sometimes we don't know where a word is rooted from. This word, this exhortation that we use so often is actually rooted from a holy day. Okay. He said, it says right here, do not sorrow for the joy of the Lord 
is your strength. I know that hearing the law and you're hearing what the word of God is saying to you. It could be the gospel. It could be the law. It could be the prophets. But when you're hearing the law, the word of the Lord sometimes, and you find yourself falling short, sometimes you're like, God, I know I haven't done all that you're asking me to do. So how many, I ain't even talking about the law on tonight. How about, watch this, how about the people that know they ain't even getting the gospel right? You hear the words of Yeshua himself and we still find ourselves falling short. And we know all sin and fall short of glory, but that's not where we should stay. So he says something strategic right here. He says, do not sorrow. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. So when you find yourself derelict of your duty as an ambassador of Christ, do not sorrow. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. This is a word that is rooted from a holy day. So we are echoing an exhortation from years, this, this word got history behind it. This exhortation has history behind it. So when you say the joy of the Lord is my strength, I dare you to put some history behind it. No, I think you didn't hear me. You heard me the first time. Let you say it again. Put some history. Okay. I don't care what happened yesterday. I don't care what, did, what fell short this year. This day is holy. This day is the day Yahweh has ordained. We shall rejoice. Verse 11. So the Levites quieted all the people saying, be still. For the day is holy. Be still. And, and in Hebrew, it's like, hush, y'all, y'all tripping. I know they probably didn't say it like that, but, you know, that's how I would say it. Y'all, hey, calm down. You're hearing this word so that you can get right. If God allowed you to hear this word, that means that you have time to make corrections. You ought to give God glory right there. If you're hearing the word of God, I think sometimes I say it like this all the time about prophecy. Do you not know that warning is mercy? We don't like to hear a word of warning because it ain't happy. It don't get you off your seat. It don't send you running around the building. And this ain't a word of warning. This is a word of celebration. But uh, the thing about it is, is that God has given us something specific, and we shouldn't mourn when we hear the word of God. We should give him praise. We should celebrate because he's giving us an opportunity to get it right. Mm. We magnify him because he gives us mercy. We glorify him because he gives us grace. Mm. So Levi's quieted all the people saying, be still. For the day is holy. Do not be grieved. Do not be grieved. Actually, I got one more verse, but watch this. And all the people went their way to eat and drink to send portions and rejoice greatly because they understood the words that were declared unto them. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. Someone say thank you, Lord, for your word. It's interesting. Israel assembled in the open square. Somebody say in the open square. I'm not going to spiritualize the text. I just want to put you in a particular mindset. Watch this. Israel assembled in the open square that was in front of the water gate. Somebody say the water gate. Oh, follow me here. Nehemiah 3 maps out the gates, towers, and walls of Jerusalem in a counterclockwise direction. Mm, it would seem like it was going backwards, but it was starting at the same point that it was going in that, but there was a process that he wanted to send them through first. Is that all right? Verse 1 through 5, the sheep gate, the tower of Mia, which is to say the hundred tower of Hanel. A proper flock is a hundred, by the way. So if one is missing, then you only have 99, and you know what he's going to find that one. 
It's just interesting that the sheep tower would be by uh, the hundred tower. The sheep gate, rather, would be by the hundred tower. Just, just interesting stuff. So the tower of Mia, the tower of Hanel, mm, God's mercy. Anyway, so, okay, I can't do this tonight. <laughs> the sheep gate, the tower of the hundred, and the tower of God's mercy, and the fish gate. Mm. Then verse 6 through 12, the old gate, the broad wall, the tower of the furnaces. Mm-hmm. Verse 13 through 19, the valley gate. Somebody say the valley gate. The valley gate, the dung gate, the fountain gate. Verse 20 through 27, the angle. Somebody say the angle. Remember when I told y'all we build angles? Here we go. The angle, the water gate, the great projecting tower by the king's palace, and the great projecting power by the open, which is to say the hill. Verse 28 through 31, the horse gate. Mm. The east gate and the Mifkod gate, the gate of inspection or the gate of muster, assembly, if you will. And that gate connected back to the east side of the sheep gate. So you have 10 distinctive gates. I promise you I'm going somewhere tonight. You have 10 distinctive gates. Now... I give you the gates, but I also want you to give, their, give you their, their symbolism. Is that all right? So when we get to the water gate, hopefully this sits in your system a different way. Watch this. The sheep gate symbolizes sacrifice, salvation, and sanctification. I'll say it again. Sacrifice, salvation, and sanctification. The fish gate. Somebody say the fish gate. Now hear me naturally and hear me spiritually. This gate represents trade because they traded in fish. And when, when what happens is when they cast their line and they reel in the fish, the fish trades atmospheres. It goes from underwater to on land. And the fish is pulled out of the water. And it's a symbolism also of rebirth. Okay, because the fish is pulled. Okay, let me go back over here. I don't know if I'm there yet. So, trade, redemption, and evangelism. These are the premier gates. Somebody say the premier gates. This is where it gets started. Oh, I'm talking about your walk of faith, by the way. These are the premier gates because someone had to sacrifice for you to have salvation. Somebody say Yahshua. Mm -hmm. And he gave you salvation. And once you come into salvation, then you start working unto sanctification. In order to get salvation, you must be caught. You must trade your old life for this new. You got to come out of your old atmosphere into a new atmosphere. And you are redeemed by the Holy One himself. Hmm. That's evangelism. That's what he did for us, and that's what we do to help others. I'll keep going. Those are the premier gates, the old gate. Somebody say the old gate. Now, the old gate is establishment. It's guidance and experience. Establishment, guidance, and experience. Somebody say the old gate. Mm -hmm. The valley gate. Lord have mercy. Y'all know, y'all remember that this is the gate that Nehemiah first enters when the king has given him passes where he's gotten those permits that we were talking about praying for. He's gotten those permits and now he can go through the land. And the first gate that he comes to is the valley gate. The valley gate represents decision. Y'all ever heard of the valley of decision? It represents decision, examination, and endurance. Somebody say endurance. Hmm. Now, here's something interesting. The longest distance between gates is between the valley gate and the dung gate. The longest distance between gates is between the valley gate and the dung gate. Isn't it something like, it seems like you go through a low season for a long time. 
before you finally get it out your system, valley gate to dawn gate. Valley gate to dawn gate. It's the, long, it's the longest, if you actually see the topographical, it's the longest wall. They call it the broad wall. It's a long way between the valley gate and the dawn gate. And sometimes you're ready to get rid of some stuff, but you ain't got to the gate yet. Because if you was by the valley gate and you had figured out that I need to get rid of some stuff that's in my system, some stuff that's wrecking my mind, some stuff that's wrecking my heart, some stuff that's wrecking my household, and you're like, I'm ready to get rid of it, but you ain't made it to the dung gate yet. And it's one gate that's built for release. Somebody say, there's a gate for that. We don't bring the sheep in the dung gate. We take the sheep dung out the dung gate. Oh, I hope you're hearing what I'm saying. The only thing that leaves that dung gate is refuse. Are you hearing what I'm saying? These are the proving gates. These are the proving gates. The dung gate. The dung gate is the next gate, if we're going counterclockwise again. So the dung gate symbolizes removal, refining, and a turning point. Removal, refining, and a turning point. And again, if you look at the map, it's literally where the wall turns northward. Things start looking up. Now, this is the way, these are the plans that Yahweh gave to Nehemiah. And it's interesting if we look at it, From the top down, and we look at it from a north, south, east, west, we look at it from a map orientation, and we begin to see the way that it was written out. We see a path. And right here at the dung gate, somebody say at the dung gate. At the dung gate, there's a turning point. I'm sorry, maybe this is too good to me. Now, the dung gate, if you haven't heard already, it's the most southern gate. This is as low as it goes. Now, the gate that's next to it. Now, here's the interesting thing, that the fountain gate is very close to the dung gate. I'm talking about distance, literal distance. It's very close to the dung gate. So after you finish releasing all the nasty stuff, then you can come to the fountain gate. Uh-uh, uh-uh. It's too good. I'm just talking about the design of the city. That's all we're talking about tonight. The fountain gate. Now, the fountain gate represents cleansing, flow, and the living waters of the Holy Spirit. Cleansing, flow, and the living waters of Ruach HaKodesh. These are the process gates. Because there's some things that you need to process out, and then there's another process that you need to go through to go onward. The water gate. Somebody say the water gate. The water gate represents the word. I'm coming back to it, I promise. The water gate represents the word. The horse gate. The horse gate has uh, one real symbolism in the Bible, and it's warfare. So the horse gate represents warfare. So isn't it something that he would give you a word before he sent you to warfare? He didn't send you to warfare when you came in the sheep gate. He sent you after you had got all, released all this stuff. See, some of us are trying to go to war, and we got too much mess still up in us, and we wonder why we're sluggish in war. You ain't going through the right process yet. You're trying to skip gates, and it ain't going to work. Anyway, these are the power gates. Then we have the east gate. The east gate represents the risen, residing, and soon to return sun. I say it again. The east gate, somebody say the east gate. You know what side the sun rises on, right? The east side. It is believed that this is the same gate that Yeshua came through on the triumphal entry, and it's the same gate that it is believed that he will return through. So again, the east gate represents. The risen, residing, and soon to return, S-O-N. 
last gate, the inspection gate. The inspection gate symbolizes judgment and destiny. And there's two sides to judgment. You're going to end up on one side, the goat side, or the sheep side. These are prophetic gates. So you have the premier gates, the proving gates, the process gates, the power gates, and the prophetic gates. Y'all ready to go? Watch this. By order of appearance, the first six gates were all broken. So when we come into chapter 3 of Nehemiah, we find that the first six, so the sheep gate was broken because you know when you came into salvation, if you will be honest, you was broken when you came in. Some of us are still dealing with brokenness now. So the sheep gate was broken. And the fish gate was broken. And the old gate was broken. Here's the reason why sometimes the old gate is broken. The old gate is broken because we're too focused on the new thing and haven't been established yet. We want to do the new thing. We want to go to New Testament and don't understand Torah. You know I'm going to do it all. You want to go to New Testament and don't, the New Testament cannot stand. It doesn't matter what denomination you come from. It doesn't matter. If you're talking, we talk about Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, and we're talking about the same person, you cannot have the New Testament without the Torah. You can't do it. When Yeshua goes to a wilderness, he ain't pulling from the New Testament. He's pulling from the Torah. He's pulling from Deuteronomy. All right. Probably not. Y'all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so he's pulling from the Torah. Somebody say he's pulling from the Torah. And here's the thing. If, you don't have, if you're not established in that, it's going to be a difficult time for you to, to really get into what God is trying to tell us in the person of Yeshua. Because Yeshua is the Torah incarnate. He's like, I'm not just going to talk to you about it. I'm going to show you how to walk this thing out. Watch this. I'm going to show you how to walk your faith out in your flesh. Mm-hmm. But the old gates are broken. The valley gate, the gate that he came in through, he might have had to duck, get around, but he had to fix some stuff on that valley gate. And we know that valley gate is that low place. Literally, figuratively, spiritually, is that low place. It's an elongated depression if you look at the actual definition of it. It's talking about the land. But do you hear me spiritually? And so the valley gate was broken. And the dome gate was broken. Couldn't get stuff out of our system. We was wondering, we had said that we'd been healed of our history, but every time it comes up, we still get just as mad as if when it first happened. You haven't gotten over the trauma because guess what? Your dung gates have been broken. Okay, I'm not trying to be graphic, but if anybody has dealt with constipation, you want to get it out. It just don't want to move. Okay, come on, somebody. You done had a baby. You done had it yourself. Or you done deal with somebody else that told you about it. And there's certain things that you have to put in your system to get certain things out of your system. You can't keep putting sticky stuff in your system and expect it to move. You got to get something that's going to flesh it out. <laughs> Come on now. You have to take some stuff to loosen up that hard stuff. I ain't trying to be nasty. I'm just being for real. And I ain't trying to be graphic. I'm just being for real. Anybody that's done had a release and had to give God praise for it, be like, thank you, Lord. See, y'all laughing. Some of, y'all, some of the young folk laughing. Okay, laugh now, cry later. Ah. 
You didn't even care about how stinky it was because you were just glad it got out of your system. I wonder if we will come to the house of the Lord and don't worry about how much it stink. Just get it out your system. Don't worry about how it sounds. I know when it's coming out, it sounds gross. I know it does. But it got to get out your system. What them season folks say? Better out than in, baby. But see, we don't listen to the season folks no more because the old gates. Okay, I'm just talking about these gates. And the fountain gate. The fountain gate. The fountain gate was broken. It's interesting. The first six gates all require repair. And it's interesting that the number six represents man. Man is all the way broken. So all the gates of man are broke. All the gates of man need repair. All the gates of man need rebuilding. But something happened, pastor, when they got over to an elder, ministers, preachers, teachers, sons, and daughters of the Most High God. Something happened when they got to the water gate. If you're reading chapter 3, when they got to the water gate, what no repairs to do because the word of God is infallible. The word of God don't need no rebuilding. The word of God don't need no repair. And so when they got to the water gate, they just kept on moving. They had to re do repairs on the opposite side of the word. But the word gate, the water gate, they were just like, this was good. And it's interesting that he situates the people of God assemble in front of the only gate that didn't need repair. And not only did they stand in front of the water gate, the only gate, the gate that didn't need no repairs, the first gate that didn't need no repairs, because the horse gate needed repairs above it. But when they got to the water gate, it's interesting that they stood in front of this gate in an open space where all the people could gather, where all the people could understand. And there was a flow of God that was coming through there. And the people stood from morning until midday just hearing the word of God. And they were saying, amen, amen. And they were worshiping the Lord. They had their hands lifted. They had their face bowed down to the ground just from hearing the word and they began to weep because they didn't understand that the word was being told to them that so they could understand that the word is going to strengthen you the word is going to repair you that's why you're standing here that's why you're sitting here at the water gate somebody say I'm sitting at the water gate they came to the water gate on the first day of ethanim. And ethanim means enduring. So they heard endurance by the water gate. I'm sorry, they were in the place of endurance hearing the word of God. Hold on. They were in the season of endurance hearing the word of God. Is anybody listening to what I'm saying? Somebody say, this is the day. And they said, they stood, the women, the children, the men, they heard the word of God on the first day of eating them. Just so happens in front of the water gate. I don't want to spiritualize the text. I just want to say they just so happened to hear the word right in front of the opening of the water gate. The only gate, the one gate that didn't need any rebuilding, didn't need any repairs. On the first day of endurance, <laughs> on the first day of endurance, hold on, because ethanim, ethanim means some more things. It means steady flowings. The word flowed, oh God. The word flowed from morning until midday while they were standing at the water gate. The unadulterated, the uninterrupted, the uncorruptible word of God was flowing to his people on the first day of the seventh month in front of the water gate. This is the. <laughs> the 
this is the day. It's interesting because if you're counting, the water gate is the seventh gate. And it's the first gate that doesn't need repair. Hmm, the seventh and the first. How did that happen? How did that happen? It's the seventh gate mentioned, and it's the first gate that doesn't need repair. It's the seventh and the first on the seventh and the first day. Hmm. Just so happened. It's the seventh of ten gates mentioned, and it's the first gate mentioned. Needs no repairs. Because the word of God. The word of God doesn't need to be rebuilt. It doesn't need to be renovated. It doesn't need to be refurbished. It doesn't need a remix. Just preach the word. I'm telling y'all how they built the city. I'm just reading the word. Because all the first six gates, you know, the gates of men, they were all broken. But when they got to the word gate, I mean the water gate, somebody say, get me to the water gate. I know I got to come in the sheep gate. I know I can't get, I know I can't skip the processes. I understand that. But somebody say, get me to the water gate. Because I've been stuck between the valley gate and the dung gate long enough. God help my soul. I've been stuck. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I've been stuck between the valley gate and the dung gate long enough. I've been stuck between depression and constipation. I'm sorry, I got to say it the way it is. I've been stuck between depression and stuff that can't get out of my system long enough. Get me to the fountain gate long enough to get cleaned up of my mess up. But get me to the water gate. Ethanine means steady flow. It means endurance. It means perennial flow. Continuous flowing. Hmm. Say the word of God needs no repairs. It's unadulterated, it's infallible, it's eternal. It needs no repairs. It needs no repair. I got a question. Zion, do you know what day this is? This is Ethan M1. The seventh month and the first day. Ethan M, enduring. The month of steady flowings, duly named because permanent streams. God, I hope you're hearing me prophetically right now. I say permanent streams. I want to hear it one more time for the people that's listening prophetically right here that can get with me and believe God that that, that, that permanent streams still flowed. I want to prophesy. Can I do that for somebody that's going to live? I said perennial streams are about to start flowing. Can somebody just receive that? I say perennial streams are about to start. Okay, perennial streams. They weren't ever. They didn't never stop flowing. We just had to get to the water gate. The streams, are you hearing me, church? The streams have always been there. And let me tell you something that is true today in the natural. They're still flowing. Now, can you receive it spiritually? Somebody say perennial flow. Say, I'm connected to the streams. I'm connected. Oh, God, I don't know how to do it right. I'm connected to the streams. I wish I had half a hoop. I'm connected to the streams. Because I'm at the water gate. Anybody by the water gate? Yeah. Nehemiah 8 and 3 says this. The text tells us Ezra read from the book of the law in the open square. In the open square that was in front of the water gate from morning until midday. I want you to see this for yourselves. Before the men and the women and, and women and those who could understand and the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. 
Now, the text does not tell us exactly which book was read. Nevertheless, we're going to go old school style. Nevertheless, for instructional purposes, Leviticus 23. Leviticus 23. Leviticus 23. Mm -hmm, that means you're going to have to turn. I said old school style. And you looking up there, I said old school style. See the gates? We don't repair the gates. Turn with me, if you will, in your Bible or your device. I said for instructional purposes, y'all still, I literally, I wrote it in here for instructional, right here, it's right here. I want to pull out, okay, I just want to make sure that y'all, I want you to put your hands on it. Leviticus 23, verse 23 through 25, it says this, then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the children of Israel saying in the seventh month. On the first day of the month, you shall have a Sabbath rest. Somebody say, I'm resting, I'm resting. in my worship. In my worship. <laughs> he said, you rest from your work, but you don't stop worshiping me. Matter of fact, you focus on your worship. Okay. You shall have a Sabbath rest, a memorial of blowing trumpets. Did we not blow the trumpet on tonight? Hmm? In the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall have a Sabbath breath, a memorial, blowing trumpets, a holy convocation. Somebody say, this is his holy convocation. I said what I said. I said what I said. Take it up with a text. Don't get mad at me. You coming against, I'm reading the scripture. Verse 25. You shall do no customary work on it, and, somebody say and, and, you will do no customary work. You will do no servial work. You won't do what you want to do, but and, somebody say and, and you shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Now, we do not owe the Lord an animal sacrifice. Hebrews is very clear about this. Nevertheless, Paul is very clear when he says, you offer your body a living sacrifice. Somebody say, what? Holy! This is your reasonable service. Sacrifice was reasonable. This offering required bullets. It required lambs. It required the offering that was required on the new moon too. It was a hefty offering. That they had to bring. This is when you say, don't appear before the Lord empty. Yeah, this is that time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not on your live stream because you can't find. Anyway, let me get back on here. Um, uh -uh, We're not going now. We're going to rejoice. <laughs> and you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. Numbers 29 and 1. Numbers 29 and 1. Numbers 29 to 1. And, and, in the seventh month, uh-huh, on the first day of the month, uh-huh, you shall have a what? Holy convocation. You shall do no customary work. For you, it is a day of blowing the trumpets. Verse 2 through 6 speaks to the burnt offering. Listen to this. The burnt offering, the grain offering, the sin offering, besides the burnt and the grain offerings for the new moon. Let me say it again. The burnt offering, the grain offering, the sin offering, besides the burnt and the grain offerings for the new moon. A sweet aroma, an offering made by fire to the Lord. Mm, think it not strange, these fiery trials, which ought to try you as though some strange thing happened to you, but re rejoice? Okay. 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 Here's another question, Zion. 
do you know what day this is? This day is a day of convocation, consecration, and celebration. This day is a day of truth, tribute, and trumpets. This day is a day of assembly, attentiveness, and appointment. This day is a day of oneness, openness, and ordinance. This day is a day of word, worship, and wonder. This day is a day also known as Rosh Hashanah. And I say it like that for a reason. It's also known as Rosh Hashanah or Rosh Hashanah. This day is the first day of awe. Or as they would say it, Asheret Yemi Teshuvah. Therefore, this day is a day of repentance, rejoicing, and rest. According to Nehemiah 6.15, Israel had just finished repairing the walls and the gates of Jerusalem five days ago. Or six, depending on the calendar. Five or six days ago on the 25th of Elul. Y'all remember that from corporate power? This day, this day there was a much deeper work to accomplish. Say there's a deeper work to accomplish. This day. There was a time word was declared. There was a timely word that was needed to be declared. And furthermore, there was a declaration that needed to be understood. The question is, ladies and gentlemen, do you know what day this is? The text says, this day is holy to our Lord. It doesn't matter how man holds it. It doesn't matter what man thinks about it. This day is holy to Yahweh. And he has specific instructions. Do not sorrow. Do not sorrow. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. Joy in the text in the Hebrew is kedva. It means joy. It means gladness. It means rejoicing. Strength is pronounced ma'uz or ma'oz. It means a place or means of safety, protection, refuge, stronghold, a fortified place, figuratively a defense, a force, a fortress, a rock. And so we understand the joy of the Lord is an eternal refuge. So when you're saying the joy of the Lord is my strength, there's no need for me to feel in danger because I got a hiding place. Even when I'm under attack, I got a refuge. Hit me two times, I got a sanctuary. Ah! Really, we don't have to ask him, Lord, prepare me a sanctuary. He is the sanctuary. Somebody say Yahweh is the sanctuary. The joy of Yahweh is the sanctuary. It's our sanctuary. It's our refuge. It's our fortress. It's our stronghold. It's our rock. It's our place to depend upon. It's our place that sometimes we got to go hiding in. Somebody say, he hides me. There's a reason why some of you haven't gone public yet, because he's hiding you. And I know you're ready to be seen, but somebody ought to give him praise. Say, thank you for hiding me. Thank you, thank you for hiding me. Thank you for hiding me. Because if I would have gone public too early, I would have been exposed. Okay. I would have been exposed because I hadn't made it to that water gate yet. Woo! But today, 
This is the day I'm standing at the water gate. Yeah. The people, understand, the people were mourning, weeping, and sorrowful because they knew they had fallen short. Isn't it something when you've accomplished a great work, but you still know that you've fallen short of the glory of God? They've just completed a great work. They got the rest of the wall up, the other half of the wall up in 52 days. That's a great work. But when they heard the word of God, they started weeping. They was like, oh, God, because we've done the physical part, but we've missed the, the spiritual. Let me say it one more time. See, a lot of us have done the physical part, and people can see what we built. But the Lord is looking at you, and he's like, there's something that's lacking. And when the word came through Ezra, the scribe and the priest, the people recognized themselves. He was reading the word. And sometimes you want to get mad with the preacher and the teacher and the apostle and the prophet when all they're doing is giving you the word. They say, they preach hard. Man, just get right with God and do it now. I hadn't been exposed to the feast before. Well, now you have. This is the day. This is the day. Nevertheless, this day is when sorrow and grief, hear me closely because we know this is the season of sound. This day is when sorrow and grief are silenced. I, don't, I need you to. I read you. I need you to hear that. This day is the day when silence, when grief and sorrow are silenced. Mm, shut it up. This day is when rejoicing is realized. This is an opportunity to hear, understand, and abide in the way, word, and will of Yahweh. This day is the day Yahweh has ordained. I know we like to say this is the day that Yahweh has made. This is the day that he has made, and this is the day that he has ordained. We shall rejoice and be glad. Watch this right now. If you are able to stand on your feet, it doesn't matter how much sorrow you feel. It doesn't matter how much grief you're going through right now. This is the day Yahweh has ordained. His words say that we shall be rejoiced. He said we shall re silence your sorrow, silence your grief, silence your frustration. This is the day Yahweh has made. We shall rejoice and be glad. We shall rejoice and be glad. This is the day Yahweh has ordained. Say he ordained, he ordained. this rejoicing. Yes. Say he ordained this rejoicing. I will rejoice. Now make it corporate. Say we will rejoice and be glad. Now somebody build a praise in this house. Brick by brick, build a praise. Stone by stone, build a praise. Gate by gate, build a praise. Tower by tower. Somebody say build a praise. I'm not asking you to praise tonight. I'm telling you to praise. Yep, I'm that bold. I'm telling you to praise. Get out of yourself. Get out of your grief. Get out of your sorrow. Get out of your frustration. I know everything ain't right. I know everything ain't where you want to be. Forget all that. I know you can be so much father by now. Forget all that. I know nobody can't see your anointing. Get past all that. This is the day Yahweh has ordained. We shall.
the text declared this day is holy stay with me for just a little while remain on your feet this day is a day for a sevenfold release this is a word somebody say this is a word at the water gate this is a word released to retain our interest this is a word released to reestablish an appointed time of God this is a word released to revitalize corporate worship this is a word released to remove mourning weeping and grief this is a word released to resound in the joy of the Lord somebody give him a praise right there This is a word released, resulting in feasting and charity. Last one, this is a word released to render understanding. Do you understand the words declared to you? If so, if so, rejoice greatly. What day this is somebody say this day somebody say this day somebody say this day is holy say this day say this day is holy this is the day Yahweh has ordained we shall rejoice greatly come on rejoice greatly come on rejoice greatly come on give the Lord a praise Come on, give Yahweh a praise. Come on, give him a praise. Silence your frustration. Silence your grief. Silence your discouragement. Silence your disappointment. Silence your sickness. Silence your illness. Silence your waywardness. Silence your lack of study. This is the day. This day. Is holy. This day is holy.